Today is the 17th of October 2022 and this is a brief update on the almost year-long venture to the completion of the first suburban seismic forecasting station. Now with the aid of EPD laboratories, certain aspects of this project was able to be put forth and possible. Now for those who are not familiar with electrodynamic seismic forecasting, even in its rudiment nature, I highly suggest looking into the original works of Eric P. Dollard in which he laid extensive groundwork into the sophistication of seismic research and seismic forecasting as a whole. I also presented a simplified approach building off of his original ideas and this may be seen in the link below in the description of this video. Now shown on the right is the seismic forecasting rack itself which houses all the sensitive VLF receivers and necessary chart recording apparatuses. And the rack on the left is an auxiliary unit for telluric research, but also houses transmitters and other auxiliary receivers, which work in tandem with the seismic forecasting rack itself, so that to eventually broadcast information in the form of telemetry on some allocated frequency. Now to go over the specific bay sections of the seismic rack, here we have the oscilloscope which allows us to visually observe the waveforms coming off the receivers or the antenna and telluric leads. Below are the three chart recorders. This one measures the telluric signal coming off the receivers. This one measures the earth to ionosphere or above ground signal likewise coming off the receiver as well. And this one measures the raw telluric potential without any filtering. Below is a VLF receiver, or a frequency selective voltmeter, that receives the signal specifically on one frequency. In this case, it'll be 10 kilocycles, but for this demonstration, we have it on 3 kilocycles. Below this is the patch panel to which the above ground leads, the flat top antenna, and the telluric potential leads connect to and can thus be patched in to whatever measuring equipment. Below this is a second frequency selective voltmeter that achieves the same result, but instead receives the overground signal or the earth to ionosphere potential. Below this is an experimental bay in which fellow colleague Jeremy Jones has imposed a specific measuring device or data logger which receives the raw static potential of the overground signal without any filtering. Now this is just for experimental means. Below here is a micro micro ammeter that is able to measure the current of the telluric signal with great ease and possibly the Earth to ionosphere signal. Now this unit was graciously given to me by Aaron Murakami for this type of research. I was able to fix it up, replace the capacitors, and refine the unit so that it completely works now. Below this is the filtering bay, which on the other side is not shown right now, but consists of the 60 cycle, 3rd harmonic, and 5th harmonic filtering traps. Below this is the cathode follower section in which two 5687 tubes are used as cathode followers in conjunction with the two frequency selective voltmeters to act as an impedance bridge or an impedance match to the telluric leads and the flat top earth to ionosphere leads. And below this, which is the final unit, is the power supply unit. Now I'll get into some issues concerning this portion in a later part of the video. Moving on to the second rack, which is the RF rack, um, in conjunction with the seismic rack, this is also an experimental telluric test bed, which here we can see on the first unit is a two-channel oscilloscope for telluric experimental measurements. Below is a tuning unit for a transmitter unit. 
Here is an experimental push-pull 807 transmitter for telluric purposes, as well as a receiver, which is used usually just for simplistic entertainment means, but also for scientific measurements. Here is a signal generator used to tune any telluric means or telluric experimental setup, which is located outside, and an audio bay for the receiver above, but also for the seismic rack receivers. Now to demonstrate the received telluric signal, here I have the frequency selective voltmeter turned on to an appropriate bandwidth at 2.5 kilocycles. It is tuned to 3 kilocycles for this purpose, and it has an attenuator right now activated to negative 70 dB, or decibels. Here we can see that the signal being received is roughly negative 10 decibels or so, so we could roughly say that the approximate signal strength of this telluric lead, or the, just the telluric setup in general without any filtering, is roughly negative 80 decibels. And here, if I increase the audio gain of the unit, which is connected to the audio amplifier down below on the RF rack, you could hear the signal. So I'll do that. And we could hear through still the sea of popping, which is the natural electrical earth phenomenon taking place. We could definitely hear the man-made ninth and fifth harmonics in the background, most likely from the neighbor's non-linear loading of LEDs, compact fluorescence, and what have you. I will now demonstrate the great sensitivity of this receiver, and that I will plug a non-linear load into the local outlet of this installation. Now this load, which is otherwise known as a cell phone charger, emits vast interference which could be easily picked up with a VLF receiver at a appreciable distance. Now for this case, the receiver still possesses its negative 70 decibel attenuator, and never mind the interference in the background in which it is being shown above negative 10 decibels. This indicates that someone within the vicinity of this facility has turned on a very large sum or just a very large nonlinear apparatus. Now I will go ahead and plug the device in and I will have the audio run in the background. Notice the increase of the dip as I plug it in and the very sound which is emitted by the speaker. I'll plug the phone charger in. I just took the charger out, I'll place it back in. And as we can see, something such as small device, such as a phone charger, despite that is able to release a vast amount of interference perceptible at a decent distance. With the oscilloscope in this position, we are picking up the telluric signal, or telluric potential that is, showing to be a distorted sine wave filled with harmonics and man-made interference. To better visualize the telluric signal in an unfiltered mode, Here's the audio output taken off the Sierra Selective Voltmeter with the telluric leads connected to it. Notice the occasional high amplitude impulses or transients which appear and vanish readily. These are in fact the telluric impulses we are after. In conjunction with the receivers to measure the telluric signal, it is also possible to use this micro microammeter to measure the telluric current. Granted that the telluric current in this case is going to be measured in direct current units, it will have a specific polarity which could be changed and is designated by the switch here. So without further ado, I'll turn it on and wait for the meter to stabilize. 
Okay, now it is stabilized. And right now, we have the setting to 10 to the minus 4 micro amperes. So let's adjust that again. And right now, that is the live telluric current without any filtering. So right now, we could say that our relative telluric current is about 300 microamperes. Taking a look at the chart recorder base section, we could determine that these two chart recorders require different voltages to run on as opposed to this one. These two require 12 volts direct current, whereas this one requires 120 volts AC, which these two are supplied by a transformer and rectifier. Now, all three chart recorders are identical in the sense that their inner mechanics, which is unveiled by this thumb screw, have the identical mechanisms to drive the paper. We see that we have a roll of paper that is dispensed at a rate of a quarter of an inch per hour, making each roll last approximately four months when run continuously. We also see that it is driven directly by a 12-volt motor, or in the other case, a 120-volt motor. Now, they are all identical in that case, also in the sense that they require a needle which is pressed upon by the paper with action of a spring clockwork type compressor, which is a metal bar across this part section of the chart recorder. These two have windows so that to physically mark the paper with any notation as needed, whereas this one doesn't. But of course, all of them are directed by these three switches so that they can be turned on and turned off with great ease. Now, to demonstrate that, I'll turn each one on individually. We could start hearing that popping noise, which is essentially this bar on the inside of the chart recorder, which is actively pressing against the needle connected to the galvanometer, which therefore presses upon the pressure-sensitive chart recorder paper and makes a notation, as seen by this one, which has run, been run continuously for a couple hours and I will turn these all on. And now we can hear all three chart recorders run. Now, of course, when the seismic rack is in complete 24-hour operation, these chart recorders will be continuously run and hence produce this noise. The last part of the rack to cover is the power supply bay. This unit, which is in operation right now, is showing that the heater supply, which is being regulated by a variable transformer, is producing a direct current voltage of roughly 12 volts, and that the inline voltage to the variable transformer is roughly 92 volts AC, which of course is then rectified properly. This 12 volts is thus powering the heaters, or the filaments, of the 5687 tubes belonging to the cathode follower bay section right in front. Power is being indicated by the two pilot lamps on either side for the two 5687 tubes. The only issue which seems to persist is that, granted that the sensitivity of the cathode followers is as such, that the supply of a plate or filament voltage seems to induce an AC hum within the 5687 heaters and circulate even to the frequency selective voltmeters. This persistent problem will be voided in a future video by the use of 12 volt 5 ampere per hour batteries as was commonly practiced, except in this case in a smaller scale, in the central offices of telephone exchanges. In summary, the work completed thus far on both racks is now only limited to the addition of a couple more bay sections and the addition of a battery-operated power supply for the cathode followers. More will be shown in a later video showcasing the finalized setup.